I think, you know, talking about where you start and where you grow and where you live, I think uh, a, a natural analogy is, is plants. Um, plants are, uh, start out as seeds and they sprout and then they grow, they start to grow, uh, and then they uh, develop roots which allow them to bear fruit. And I think our spiritual life and even our life in, in, in community is, is pretty similar. We, uh, I think God has some things to say about the, the way that we start, the way that we grow in his truth, and the way that we live in life uh, through him. So if you have your Bible, open up to John 14. We're going to be looking at the first few verses. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in a seat around you. Feel free to use that and, and take it home. Um, so starting in verse 1, Jesus says, this is the, the, the night before he's crucified. He's uh, with his disciples. He's um, you know, speaking with them. These are some of his last words. He says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it weren't I so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. So he's talking about where he's going, where he's about to go to. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. So he's talking about he's going to leave, he's going to prepare a place, but he's coming back for him, and that they know the way. And uh, normally it's, it's, it's Peter who kind of jumps up and asks what everybody's thinking about uh, something Jesus said uh, after a parable or something. But in this case, Thomas says something. In, in verse 5 it says, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? So he's thinking very tangible. A lot of the ways uh, that we think about what something Jesus said, something very concrete. Like, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? It would be like me telling you, well, let's meet there for dinner at 6. And you're like, you didn't say where, so I may not even know how to get there. I may not know the way. So we're th he's thinking very tangible here. And looking for directions, steps, or something very uh, concrete. Um, uh, I, I haven't been to seminary, but I studied Greek one year at Denton Bible's Lay Institute, and uh, was having my quiet times in, in Greek. And I was in this this passage right here, and the the best thing for me, at least, in studying Greek was it forced me to read extremely slowly because each word you have to parse out and see what it says and try to understand what it says in context, and and it's very powerful and. It, it, it was a great tool to slow down and consider these words that maybe I've read many times and can kind of gloss over to some degree. So I was reading verse 6, and it says, Jesus said to him, so I'm parsing this, and I read that, okay, well, Jesus is saying, okay, Jesus is speaking to him. Who's the him? It's Thomas. He's answering his question. And then the next word is uh, I am, which in Greek is very emphatic. It's... Uh, Almost like if, if, if the guy was a yeller, he'd be yelling this. He'd be pounding the table if he's a pounder. Jesus isn't doing these things, but he's very emphatic. He, maybe he turned to Thomas and looked him right in the eye and, and said this. And he says, I am. And it's, it, it caught my attention. I'm like, oh, wow, he's, he's, this is a big deal. He's not messing around with this answer. He says, I am the way. And again, I wasn't thinking of the context of where I was reading. I was like, oh, yeah, I, I think I was expecting something concrete. And he says, I am the way. And that's, that's not what I was expecting. That's much more of a Jesus, powerful, all-inclusive answer. And um, I was like, oh, he, yeah, he is the way. He is the way. It's not the law. It's not the rules. It's not the commandments. It's, it's Jesus. He is, he is the one and only way. And then I kept reading, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so in answering Thomas's question, it's, it's not what we expect, but it is very direct. I am the way. And he goes on on top of that, I am the truth. I am the light. And he also kind of answers the other question of where I'm going. No one comes to the Father but through me. This is what he's talking about. This is the core of it. That I'm talking about getting to the Father. I'm talking about eternity. I'm talking about the true life, the true meaning. I'm talking about God. I'm talking about myself. Since he is God, the way to me is me. And, it, and, it's, and it's such an answer that answers everything and it re removes the, the obligation for us to find some answer, us to achieve something, us to have something that he's already done it for us. And this is, this is the key to how we then change. He is the way. We grow in truth and live our lives. Um, one of the first times, maybe the first time I went to New York City, I was working. I was staying with my cousin James, who uh, 
worked, he was a producer for a lot of promos for different shows, kind of the bumpers and commercials and stuff that different shows made. And he did a lot at one of the networks up there. So he let me tour after hours and go on a lot of the sets of the shows and, and check it out. And then my wife came up and uh, uh, she was a fan of Live with Regis and Kathy Lee, the host at the time. And so we're like, hey, can, can we go so, see that show? And he's like, sure, I'm James. Yeah, I'll get you in. So we go the next morning to the show, and there's a line around the corner for all the, the commoners, you know, all the peasants, to wait for, for tickets. And we just walk right in the door, and they're like, where, where are you going? And we're like, James, we're with James. And they're like, please, you know, can I get you anything? And so we go in, and we sit there. And, and if you've seen the show, you know that I am the perfect demographic for this show. So I'm in the middle of the audience. I think I had a leather jacket on. And uh, the camera would just pan the audience, and I would just stare at the camera. <laughs> and my mother-in-law was watching it live while we're on it. And she, I think we were texting, and she's like, Bear's killing me. You know, quit doing this. <laughs> just watching the camera go by. But it was a good day to be there. Steve Martin, Walter Cronkite, and an actress from Star Trek were on it. It was a big day. So, but the way that we got in that show wasn't anything we did. It wasn't writing and asking for tickets. It wasn't some achievement we had. It was who we knew. James was our way into this, just like God is our way. It's who we know when, um, when we get to the end. Uh, when, we, when, we, when we stand before God, He's not going to ask you what you've done. He's going to ask you, did you know my son? Do you know the way? And uh, we have to have an answer for that. And I think that um, being our way, He is the way that we begin. He's the way we start. He's what causes our change from darkness to light, from a position of judgment to righteousness. And uh, if, if, if you know him, then you know what I'm saying. This is the way that you've been changed, the way that you went from a, a seed to, to sprouting. Um, if, if you haven't, I'd like to share a few verses with you. These are called the Romans Road, and they're on your, your info strip. Um, Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned. And again, this is, this is where the asterisk comes in. Uh, I myself sin. Uh, whether we admit it or not, we all sin daily, regularly, whether in pride or action or, or non-action. We've all sinned. Um, I believe this is a fact, and I believe the Bible makes it clear. But uh, it also goes on to say, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin are death. The, the death here ultimately is speaking about separation from life, God, separation from God. We, we've all been uh, separated from him in our sin, and we need to resolve that. We need a way to become righteous in his eyes again and remove uh, this, this blemish. Romans 5.8 says that while we were still enemies, while we were still sinners, uh, Christ died for us. But he took on this penalty that uh, the requirement of death for our sin could only be uh, met through either our own death or uh, the death of someone perfect. So he came and died for us to uh, reconcile us back with the Father. And then in Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says that if we then believe in him, that we put our faith in him and trust in him, that we are made righteous in him. This is how we can be made uh, righteous in the eyes of the Father. And I, so I encourage you, if, if you, you haven't done that, that you, you ask someone here, ask me or, or, or someone, anyone around you, uh, how to, to be changed this way, how to be introduced to the eternal God and know the way. Um, and, and, and study those verses and consider what God has said about these things. So, so he is our way. And, and many of us have uh, know this way. Many of us have been saved. We have, as again, as seeds, we have sprouted. And the next thing that a plant does is grow. And uh, we are to grow in truth. Well, Jesus is truth. He says that he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And we are to grow in that way. Grow in, in seeking him, to know him, and therefore know truth. To know him is to know God. To see him is to see God. Uh, we are to seek him, to know that truth, that who he is. Second uh, Peter 2.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are encouraged in his word to grow in truth and knowledge and wisdom. And again, he is the truth. So seeking to know him is seeking to know truth. And we do that uh, in many ways. Proverbs 4, 7 says, the beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. It's pretty uh, almost obvious. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's 
a complicated thing. It's to, to begin to grow is to begin to grow. To start is to start. There's a lot of apps out there that will um, take you through training to run like a 5K, and they're called Couch to 5K. And the idea is that you may not be running, and what's the first thing you're probably going to do in training for a 5K? You're going to run that first time. And you, you, to do it, you have to do it. And to do it better, you have to do it more. But you have to get started. So, so to get wisdom, the first step is get wisdom. Another translation, I think, says seek wisdom. So how do we seek wisdom? Uh, James 1.5 says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So he's told us that the beginning of wisdom is to get wisdom. And to grow in wisdom, ask him, and he will guide you in that. He will grant you that, that request. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the times, the way that he grows us in wisdom is through sanctification. That's the nice word for pain and trials and sharpen, ironing, sharpening iron. It, it's tough. It can be very difficult. But through those times, with the help of, of him and with others, our community, we grow in him. And we learn that he is there for us. And we know that he will be there the next time. And there's plenty of times in our lives where we go through trials, some big and some small. And he's been there for us every time. It, it's not, I used to always say in various trials that I've been through, I, I, I've always said, sometimes the doctor has to hurt you to make you better. Sometimes, you know, uh, I've taken my sons to get shots. Um, it's, it's not fun. It's painful. But it's for the better. It's, we, have, we have trust and faith that this is what's good despite the pain, despite the ultimate uh, or the, the short term. The long term is worth it. And that's a lot of times how God will grow us. But he won't disappoint us uh, as we ask and truly seek for uh, his truth, for who he is, for letting us know him better. Chris, a couple weeks ago, taught on growing in grace, and he had a, a section of it on desiring God and how do we desire God. He had three things, uh, time, study, and worship. So we spend time with him. We meditate on who he is, his attributes, what he's done for others and for ourselves in the past. We talked about study, how we study the Word, how we get together with others and learn what they've learned and ask questions. And worship, how we worship here together. We can worship alone. And, and most, almost any action or deed can be done worshipfully. So we can do things in our day-to-day -day lives with a heart of worship for Him and grow in Him. And in these ways, grow closer to Him in Him being the truth. First Peter 2.2 2 says, Like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word so that it by, by it you may grow and respect the salvation. So again, we're to seek wisdom, we're to ask for wisdom, we're to long for this truth and Jesus is the truth um, so that we might continue to grow in Him. Psalm 42, one says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you. Now, when do you think a deer pants? When, yeah, when he's running, when he's using it up, when he's when he's out of water, when he's possibly dehydrated. So we have, a, I think, a picture. So this, this is if you search for as the deer pants for the water. A lot of times, this is the kind of picture you'll find. Uh, Chris and I were looking for images for this, and, and both of us had trouble finding one that didn't already have the words on it. As the deer pants for the water. Uh, you see this in a lot of greeting cards. Do you think this deer is panting for water right now? This deer is full of water. This deer's got nothing but water. This deer is in danger of overhydrating and diluting his electrolytes. This deer needs to give some other deers a shot at this water. This deer's not panting at all. I mean, if you want, well, I looked up pictures of deers that were dehydrated and panting for water, and you're welcome. I didn't put one up here. They were disturbing. It was, it was you know, the, the vultures are circling above this deer. He's, he's wretched. And you know what that deer's doing as he's panting for water? He's thinking, i got to get water right now or I'm going to die. I am going to die. Nothing else matters right now. I'm about to die. I mean, animals, all they do, right, all day long is look for water, food, maybe care for their children if, if they're in that state. But they're just going around looking for food and water. And what happens when they're not finding water? They are, they're on the clock. They're going to die. 
I mean, panting for water, they are just puffing and puffing. They've got to get this. They're in panic mode. Got to find water um, or I'm going to lose it. I'm going to die this. I'm going to lose this battle. So when you read this, this, the, the Psalm 42, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you. The idea here is this, this guy's, I'm going to die if I don't have you, God. You are the source of life. And if I don't have you right now, I'm panting for water, I'm panting for God, and I need it right now or I'm going to die. This is the severity that this person is, is longing for God. And this is a great inspiration for us, not as a, a conviction out of obligation, like, well, I, I just I have to want God. He told me to. I'm, I've got to want Him really bad. just want to want Him, want Him, want Him. But it's, it's, it's an inspiration that, that this is who He is. This is who He is for us. And this is who He is to us. And He's right there. He's not hard to find. It's just we need to be longing for Him and seeking Him in this way to grow in Him. So he is the way. He's the start. He opens the door for us and lets us in. He is our way that we can know very easily uh, through his word. And then we grow in learning the truth of who he is. And the truth is Jesus. So the more that we know him, the more we know truth. What, what is right? What is righteous? Who is God? What is his character? And these are the things we should seek. So he is the way. He is the truth. And he is the light. He is the way that we should uh, dwell in Him. We are, there's verses about abiding in Him, living in Him. He is the life. Um, it's not up here, but John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. He is life. He is the best life. The more you have Jesus, the more you have life, the more you have the best life. And... Um, that's where we find our joy, in Him, in living in Him, dwelling in Him, dwelling on Him. And that's how we can then continue to build our roots to bear fruit uh, for Him. Um, we, uh, as we grow, uh, as we sprout, as we begin to grow, and as we develop our roots, uh, there's different aspects of that. There's the idea of uh, the physical aspect of y'all. You know, we are each other's roots. We are what ties us together. Um, we are what, what keeps us here, uh, the community. And in, in, in spiritual terms, they, they go a bit hand in hand. Is that uh, I build my roots in Jesus, but I also build my roots in y'all. And we, we give each other that stability, that roots give. You can't move around from place a plant from place to place and expect it to grow like one that has time to generate those roots. And, and we can't either. It takes exactly 10 years to live someplace 10 years. If you want to be meeting with the same guys for 20 years, it takes 20 years. You can't plant a 20-year sh shade tree and have it grow faster than 20 years. Um, we are each other's root, and that's what, what keeps us here, keeps us uh, connected. Um, a tumbleweed doesn't have root. A tumbleweed goes around, and a tumbleweed is useless. It's, it doesn't do any good. It doesn't produce any fruit. You haven't had any tumbleweed fruit in your fruit salad lately. I did, I did look up. It does, it does have one use, tumbleweed, I read. It helps in cleaning up spilled uranium. So if you want to be the kind of person that is metaphorically cleaning up toxic waste, don't worry about roots. Yep. Welcome to Benchmark. Uh, Colossians 2, 6, and 7 says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so is, he's our way, so walk in him, grow, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed in overflowing with gratitude. So we are to receive him. He is the way. We're to grow in him. He is truth. And we're to be rooted in him. He is life. So how, how can you be rooted in Jesus? Well, again, I think you can dwell in him. You can dwell on him. You abide in him. In, in dwelling on him, uh, Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence in anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. And I put the emphasis on these things because, as Matt said, we tend to dwell on them. We oftentimes dwell on things that are negative. The election. 
You know, it can take our minds and we can dwell on this thing and, and really become negative about it. But this says, dwell on these things. And what is more true, honorable, right, pure than, than Jesus? Dwelling on Him. Um, uh, we, we go to Colorado in the summer and in late July and, and August when it's 150 here, I wake up in the morning in Colorado and I get some coffee. I go out on the patio and I bring a blanket or a jacket because it's chilly. Think about y'all a little bit. Chuckle. <laughs> and then I'm drinking the coffee and I'm looking at my mountain as we call it. And I just sit there and I'm like, this is beautiful. This is awesome. And then sometimes I'll close my eyes and I'll be like, remember this when you go back to Texas. So I can come back here and I can close my eyes. But the, the fact is, is when, when I'm back here, if I try that, I open my eyes and I'm back here. It's hot. And the coffee is really hot. And it's just compounding. But when I open my eyes and I meditate on Jesus, He's there. He's still there. And meditating on Him is so much more honoring to Him. And it's so much more, for lack of a better term, it's so much more effective. When I'm, when I'm concerned about something, when I'm dwelling on the negative, or just whatever it is. It's so easy. I mean, I don't know about you, but I found life to be rather difficult at times. Emotionally, spiritually, just whatever. Um, but when I can, can focus on Him, meditate on verses that he's, he's shared, and think of Him as the Creator of the universe that, that cares about me, who loved me enough to send His Son, that... that He's there with me all the time and has led me through so many things uh, that, that He's given me the blessings of my wife and my kids and my church and His, his Word. These things don't stop when I open my eyes. He's, he's still there. And it's that quick that I can access Him, meditate on Him, and things that He's told me that are true. There's so many great verses that talk about how much He loves me and what He's done for me and how much He cares for me. And when I think about who He is and the fact that He cares for me, it's very humble. And again, that's accessible in an instant. Close my eyes and He's there. I can meditate on Him. And He, and he never goes away. So I can dwell on Him and who He is. But I can also dwell in Him. Uh, this Christian life sport is not a solo sport. It's not a one-man act. When I was a kid, my hero was Spock. He was logical, and he was cold as ice, and he was everything was about reason, and I loved that. Uh, I moved around a lot as a kid. I, I've moved over 40 times, and more most of those were before I was out of college. I mean, I've I've lived places for a month at a time or six months or something. So if you've moved, if I've moved 40 some times in 20 years, that's a lot of moves. And so I was like, I don't need anybody. I'm me, I'm myself, and I'm on my own. And it was crippling. You know, it was just, it, you know, nobody can live that way. It's, it's just stifling. Um, and, and I think I knew that, but I wanted that. I wanted that way to work. But the Christian life's not that way. Um, the, the Bible tells us that we are to bear one another's burdens, that we are to not forsake assembling together, that we are to fellowship with one another. And, and I love uh, how we do that here at Benchmark. I love that I can look out here, and I'm not that concerned about speaking in front of this group because I, I basically know everybody, and I've known a lot of y'all for a long time. So this is just, this is just having a conversation where y'all don't get a chance to talk back. And that's, that's to me, that's, that's the way it should work, right? You wait for your turn to talk, and you don't get one. We sing at the end, then you can talk now. Um... But again, it, it, it takes time to build those relationships. And some people are better than others. Some people are, have the personality or the social skills or whatever it is. But they, they develop roots more, more personally. Um, other people, it's, it's deeper, not wide, and so forth. But, but this is what we need. We need these roots to provide our stability when the tough times come. And also to, to provide us with the growth to be able to bear fruit. Um, and... and, and, and Jesus is providing that way as, again, the way, the truth, and He is the life. Um, so what kind of fruit are we supposed to bear for Him? John 15 says, in verse, starting in verse 4, says, Abide in Me, and I in you. So live in Him. He is the life. Be living in Him. Dwell in Him. As the branch 
cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abide, abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And again, if we're talking about uh, sharing with people or ministry, we can't do this on our own. We're not going to be effective by just forcing our will on people. Um, it's not really up to us. It's Him working through us. We are just the branches. We bear the fruit, but it's because of the vine uh, giving us those nutrients. And and what is the fruit? Matthew 28 says, uh, uh, it's called the Great Commission. Starting in verse 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So, this is, this is what we're meant to do, to bear fruit. We're to share the way. We're to share Jesus with other people. We're to bear fruit of the kingdom and souls of people and teaching them and showing them who he is and what he's done for us uh, to provide this reconciliation with the creator of the universe, the righteous judge that we will stand before. And out of love, uh, he has paid our debt. Um, this is something that he's done for us, and out of gratitude, we honor him, we worship him. Again, he is the truth, whether we like it or not. Um, there's there's truth uh, that I don't necessarily like. There's pain in life. I don't like that, but it's true. And pretending it's not true doesn't, doesn't make it untrue. doesn't make it not real. It just makes me less uh, wise into the ways of the world as far as God's wisdom. So we are to, to go and make disciples. We are to bear fruit in Him uh, in, in making others uh, disciples and, and His Holy Spirit working through us in their heart. And we are to teach them to observe all that He commanded you. Well, what did He command us? Uh, Matthew 22 talks about the greatest commandment. And starting in verse 36, it says, uh, someone's asking Jesus, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? Again, looking for something that's a bit more concrete. Or, oh, we'll do this. And that's it. And Jesus says to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So as we go out and we live a life in him, dwelling in him and dwelling on him, and we're bearing fruit as we grow our roots, and we're making disciples of all the nations, uh, teaching them Jesus' commands, his command is, is simple. It's love God and love us. And if we do that, we're fulfilling the whole law. We're, we're doing what is righteous. Loving Him and loving others. And, and it's kind of a circle. Well, how do we love Him? Well, we dwell on Him. We honor Him. We worship Him. We learn about Him. We learn the truth that is Jesus. Um, and, it, and it keeps going and we develop more roots. We just bear more fruit. And it goes on and on. This is This is what He has commanded us to do as being our way to salvation, our truth, and our life. This is how we go through. So you've heard, probably heard people say, bloom where you're planted. And again, the plant analogy works here. Jesus is our way to be changed from sin to righteousness. Now we'll always sin. Nobody's perfect except Jesus. But he is the one who's paid our debt to convert us. He is our way into a righteous standing with God. He is the truth. He is then what we seek to know, and to know Him is to know truth. He is truth, and that is what we are to seek. And He is life. He is the life for us. He is what gives us the, the ultimate in joy, in fellowship with Him, in peace. Uh, he is the life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So I encourage you to if you don't know him, please let me know. And get together with other people to learn the truth and develop roots. Um, find somebody uh, who maybe knows more than you. Not much, just maybe somebody who's been a Christian a little bit longer and learn from them. Uh, if you can't find anybody else, contact me. I think I've got my contact information up here. There's my phone number. There's my email address. So if you want to know somebody who's going to really take you to the next level, find me, and then I'll talk to Chris, and we'll find somebody for you to meet with.
No, I, 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 I will help if I can, or I'll find somebody else who can. But this is where life happens with other people. And uh, that's, that's difficult. That makes life vulnerable. We have to admit some things. But um, that's where things really happen. And I would love to, to spend that time with you. I just finished, I do reading plans. I just finished one going through the Bible chronologically, and I got this new wide margin Bible, which is so pretty, and I'm going to ink it all up. And I'm reading through the New Testament real slow. So if you want to read through the New Testament with me, we can do that. I'm going real slow, like half a chapter a day or something. And I'd love to, to meet with you and talk about it, or we can find somebody else. But this is, this is important. This is, this is vital. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you want the most out of life, it, it's going to take a, a little bit of work. And let's do it together you know, as a family. As a, we were talking about a family reunion every, every Sunday. This, this is your family. We're going to be spending eternity together. And uh, let's, let's kind of start that now. You know, we can know him now. We can start eternity now.